Yeah. Okay. Hi, welcome, and thank you. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland, soon to be retired from All Classical Portland, but for the time being, Aww. I'm still working there. And this is Natasha Paremsky, our soloist tonight, in the Profio Concerto. Hi, thank you. And she'll also be filling in for Carlos Calmar because he's not here. But only for a couple of minutes because... My hair is only slightly longer. Ah, yeah. So, great pants. Thanks. Those are fun. So Aren't they fun? They've got they vegetables are. on them. They're like you, really <laughs> healthy. <laughs> you and Carlos did this last night in Salem. Yeah. Right. And he yeah. said you did such a great job that he wanted you to join us tonight. Oh, good. Thank you. What about you. tomorrow and Monday? Will you do sure. it then too? Okay, yeah. Great. So if you see the name Natasha Paremsky and you see her picture and you read that she's playing Prokofiev, you might think it's this Russian woman. But listen to her voice. <laughs> Uh, yes, I've been in the States for over 20 years. So, but no problem for Russian accent. No okay. problem. Do, yeah, do a little more. Okay. Well, now it's awkward. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But speaking of awkward, Prokofiev Piano Concerto Number no. 2. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. How long wow. have you been playing this one? Since July. Oh, <laughs> so it's not like the last 10 years or something. No, this, this was a very recent addition, and it was actually Carlos who planted the seed after oh. we first worked together in Grant Park, and we did Tchaikovsky's second piano concerto there, and, you know, I was, I was you know, all over him about playing Rock 3 together. He's like, yeah, yeah, but do you play Prokofiev second? And I'm like, no. He's like, why not? What? You have to learn it. And I thought, it's kind of the last of the, I don't, I don't know if it's a war horse, but certainly a mainstream mm. Russian concerto, mainstream-ish. Not performed enough to be a war horse, probably. No. Unless it is in Russia, I don't know. It is war, though. It feels like war when yeah. I'm on stage. Yeah. So one, <laughs> he wrote five, but one and three are the ones that get played the most. Yeah. Actually, I played one here that was my first um, appearance of the Oregon Symphony. Well, that's fine. Yeah, like, ooh, seven years ago. So you were an enfant terrible, just as he was when you were. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Now you're all semi grown up. Yeah. Oh! Here he is. <laughs> Hello. You know, we blew it, Natasha. We didn't get to the, com the conductor <laughs> jokes before he got here. Bye. Yeah, he's here. Okay. We get, talked about your but hair. But she just said uh, something about Enfant Terrible, and I said, that's the right time to come in. <laughs> yeah. So, Natasha was saying that you're the one who planted the seed about learning Proco too. In a way, I think that's not... Is that really true? Yes, you said to me after Grant Park. After our first time in Grant Park, you said, why don't you play this piece? I'm like, I don't know. Ah, so I was even guilty of that because I thought, well, I'm guilty of you learning two pieces anyway. Yeah. Tchaikovsky too and oh. uh, Schoenfeld. And I thought that after that, we both agreed, I owe you. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I, th I thought I remembered you said, well, let's do Prokofiev too. And I didn't know that Okay, fine. Now you really <laughs> trouble again. <laughs> Next time, something easy. Always blame the conductor. That's what I've learned in the uh, business. You know, I learned earlier. <laughs> I learned earlier tonight that if anything goes wrong, a stagehand gets blamed. But maybe that's not really? always true. Really? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, let's okay. blame the stagehand. As long as it's not the anyone soloist. but me. You yeah. Know. Just anyone like, <laughs> but you. Anyone but yourself. Yeah. So, do you have this thing memorized? Uh, I do. I hope I do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah I <don't> know. Yes. <laughs> yes, she has. <laughs> yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah, to to memorize that, but he. Mm. Well, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. And then in the end, at the end of the day, you say, "Well, other people have memorized it, so what's your problem?" Yeah. Plus, like honestly, when you're playing that, you'll see there won't. There's no time to look at an iPad or a score. Yeah, you're kind of busy. It's, uh, yeah, I'm a little busy. Yeah. It's like the it's like the Olympics. It's like it's not it's not like Winter Olympics. It's more like the jumping. Olympics. What do they call it? Declan or something? I don't know. And anyway, there are a lot of leaps and jumps and maybe it is kind of like figure skating. Just try to look Yeah, I remember that the first, my f it was not the first time I fell kind of in love with this piece of, but I remember the first time I conducted it, 
um, that my, I was so fascinated in the third movement how the, the, the solo starts because we play an intro that is whatever and then the, the soloist does It looks like the wipes of a car when it's raining. <laughs> and I was fascinated by that. And it all, I mean, it also sounds very interesting. But then I thought, well, and then I always was fascinated in this piece, how actually you can even master this monstrosity in the first movement. The cadenza. The cadenza, because the, the, the first movement is actually, I don't know, not so insanely long. Nine, nine minutes. Nine minutes. Yeah. And f probably five of them, the orchestra just sits there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, the cadenza is five minutes long. Yeah, it's probably the longest cadenza of in a concerto. In, the, in any concert. Well, I mean, yeah. Chaik, too, has a really long cadenza. Yeah, but, but I don't it's think it's five. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel that. It's not that this cadenza feels long. On the contrary, it feels shorter than what it is. Yeah. It's just that in Tchaikovsky too you think, wow, that's hard and fast and all the other things. And in this you think, beautiful, difficult, insane. <laughs> <laughs> Is she okay? <laughs> yeah. No. So and when you sat down to learn this, where did you start? Did you the start? cadenza. Okay, I thought you might have. Oh, I started with a cadenza. I always go for the hardest bit. And I, what I didn't realize is actually the fourth movement was the one that gave me the biggest challenge, all the leaps. But uh, I started with a cadenza, and I remember when I got to, you know, the final big statement of da da da, when you cross hands and you play a big arpeggio. And I was so annoyed that day because I have goals that I set myself. I'm like, okay, today I am going to memorize the cadenza, the whole cadenza, I'm just going to memorize it today. That's my goal. That's it. I sit down, eight in the morning, I make it happen. And I got to this damn passage, which is like, you know, towards the end, sort of. And instead of, I wish I had a piano I could demonstrate, and instead of playing like him writing a straight arpeggio, G minor arpeggio, which would have made my life so much simpler, and I could have moved on, moved on to the next passage and memorized that. No, he had to twist the G minor passage like, kind of like loop it around like this and then come down and then and then the next one is also loops but in a different way and it's a good it's a dominant chord and then we come back to the G minor and then you go and then you're like why do you have to do this why and I was so annoyed and I was like I'm never going to memorize this this will never happen and in the meantime I'm trying to like keep track of my left hand going to this end of the keyboard and coming down to the other end of the keyboard as my right hand is traveling up. And I remember at the end of that day, I was just like so catatonic <laughs> <laughs> and angry because it's also, you're like memorizing such angry music that I got in a total fight with my boyfriend. I was like, I'm just angry at the world. And he's like, you're so aggressive. I'm like, I've been playing very aggressive music for a very long time today. You okay? And it's all your fault. <laughs> Are you glad you came to this tonight? Yeah. This, this is good. Well, you know, the funny, the funny thing is that I actually think a little bit exact, but s since I'm not in instruments, so I don't fight with the, not anymore with the fact that when I was a violinist, you tried to do God knows what, double stop or play octaves in tune until like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you do that for three, four hours, and then you are really like. Yeah, yeah. I actually, in a way, know that I can utilize sometimes the 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 energy, even the bad energy of music, to get rid of stuff, so that people around me don't get with all my anger issues. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my issue was that I called him too close in proximity to the end of the practice. You have to have this kind of like residual fumes. They have to leave the... Yeah, when in, in this piece you burn bit. a yeah. lot. And so don't get close, leave her for half an hour alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be at the CD table, but I'll be nice, I promise. <laughs> yeah, you'll be signing CDs at intermission? Yeah. In the lobby. Okay. You do not have big hands. Well, they're smaller than yours, but they're... Look at that. 
Okay, but you have like really big hands. Do you have really big hands? No. Let's see. Oh, see? Oh, well, just right. You could play for Coke of Two. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I actually can, this passage in the cadenza is one bar long where it sounds like she's playing with the fists. I can do that. <laughs> I have really bad news about the fisting part. You still have to hit individual notes. I know. <laughs> it's not like the sixth sonata where he actually writes a fist. He writes a clump and you're like, oh, how nice. <laughs> you have to worry about it. But the, the last movement is very notorious. I call it target practice because you're really, you're jumping from, I mean, you're just, you're crossing and jumping and that was the hardest part because the melody is actually very simple, but to memorize in which octave it occurs between which octaves it occurs, that was the hard part in my brain, like the spatial awareness. Well, hard. you play Rachmaninoff. Yeah. He had huge hands. Yeah. So how do you do that? Um, how do I play Rachmaninoff? Yeah. Well, first of all, he, uh, even though he had these huge hands and he could reach an octave plus five notes, it was insane. Oh my God. Yeah, it was a completely, like, really huge hands. Which, for me, I'm like, isn't that, like, kind of uncomfortable? Don't you get, like, get <laughs> caught? <laughs> um, but, no, but it's not like he wrote tenths all the time, like, oh, let's do like a tenth passage really quick. Like, no one writes that in music. I'm like, well, okay, you say no one and some clever composer is gonna come up with it. He's you like, just gave me an idea for okay. my first piece. <laughs> Great. Um, so, he, he, he writes so well for the piano. Actually, just like Prokofiev writes well for the piano because he was a great pianist and a huge virtuoso, both of them. But even Rachmaninoff, when he played the big chords, he always rolled them because it, it just, it was more human. I think the issue one runs into playing these concertos if you don't have a comfortable octave. And there are pianists with small hands that don't have a comfortable octave because he'll put so many notes into an octave that you better be very comfortable size-wise. How long have you been playing the piano? Um, since July. No. <laughs> <laughs> or to put it another way, how old were you when you started? Three, four? Uh, three. Three, okay, yeah. so really young. Yeah. yeah. And it was just you, that you knew that that's what you wanted to do? I knew when I was nine that that was something I was going to pursue for my life. Because that was when I heard Evgeny Kisin at Davies Symphony Hall. And I thought to myself, I want to be on stage and I want to be a soloist. And I, I want to play at Davies. And I did eight years later. No, seven years later. I played with the San Francisco Symphony. Congratulations. Thanks. That was a nice moment. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've never really, you know, people say, what would you be if you weren't a pianist? And I guess I just never really consider that completely seriously. Have you? Seriously? No. Yeah. <laughs> I always, when I was, I think, very early 20s, hanging out with friends in Vienna, we kind of pondered on the question and I said, well, I thought about being a politician. The laughter that my <laughs> friends broke out when they said, you, a politician, just never mind. But as a conductor, aren't you kind of a bit of a politician? I, I hope not. <laughs> no? <laughs> well. well, you have to bring people together. Oh, that's stage. what you do as a politician? That's news to me. Okay. <laughs> oh! Never mind. <laughs> Next question. Ah, uh, then. <laughs> Touche. Mic drop. <laughs> Are you, do you want to talk about the whole program in this half hour? You do, right? Okay. So, do you want to stay with us for the whole time? You want to go practice some more? What's your preference? Oh. You can do whatever you want. I don't know. What do you want me to do? I should go yeah. practice. <laughs> change into something How does it sound if I tell you, go practice? That sounds like, whoa! Right. 
Oh, and we need to talk about four before 20. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to look at that. <laughs> well, I'm going to go change into my comfortable concert attire now. And I'll leave you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Natasha you. Paramsky. <laughs> As I've said many times, it must be really fun to have talent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's actually... But, as I always say, talent is maybe 20%. Uh, there's the whole work thing, too. Yeah, because, I mean, she's, Natasha is just an example, but she works like an animal. I mean, she, essentially the fact that you say, do you want to practice this? I, I know what she's doing back there. And I know what she probably has been doing most of the day and yesterday and so on. And mm -hmm. there might be a time on, uh, on Tuesday then when maybe the next concerto that she plays, which I don't know what it is, might be a little easier, mm -hmm. if that even exists. We don't want to scare you off about the second piano concerto by Prokofiev. Yes, we want. We do? <laughs> it is easier to listen to than to play, that's for sure. The, the thing with the second piano concerto, because uh, we have to kind of say it in a nutshell, it's a fascinating piece of music because um, it shows you the entire uh, depth of what Prokofiev actually does. On one side, there is this very lyrical in his own way, in his own way, Prokofiev that we adore from classical symphony to Romeo and Juliet, symphony number no. five, which is high energy in part and very witty and of course playing weird harmonies, 20th century music after all, but pleasant. And then there is the entire other Tchaikovsky, then there's the other uh, Prokofiev, uh, culminating in a piece that I don't know whether I will ever conduct the Scythian Suite, which is brutal, absolutely brutal. And things like the Third Symphony, which is so, it's angry. And this piece you're going to hear tonight has from the very lyrical to the very angry going through an entire movement of sarcasm, mostly. So it's a concerto in four movements, not in three. Uh, Natasha talked about the monstrosity of the cadenza in the first. The second movement is as if you are on the highway with actually quite a lot of traffic driving out 160 miles per hour for two and a half minutes, never stopping. It's a perpetual mobile. And then you read, in, you read in the program broke and you don't know this piece and you say, it says intermezzo. Intermezzo means lean back, relax. And the first thing you are going to hear is an elephant coming at you. It's a dangerous beast. And then comes this cross hands and this movement is in its core very and a kind of nasty sense of humor, very sarcastic. You even hear in the orchestra laughter. And then comes um, the last movement, which is fairly complex, starts very manic, comes down, um, has a fake ending where you think, peace is over, no it's not. <laughs> has a passage, uh, actually a longer passage that is like we know Prokofiev from Romeo and Juliet, beautiful, and then it gets manic and then it's over, pretty much. And then there's intermission and you can meet Natasha and buy CDs and get autographs in the lobby. This concert starts in a very unusual way with the Symphony Number no. 7 by Walter Piston. He was a major figure in American classical music for much of the 20th century. Performer, composer, teacher, writer. You could probably walk over to Powell's tonight and buy any of his textbooks. They're still in use. But he's kind of easy to take for granted these days. I had never heard this symphony until today. I listened to it, and it's really cool. It's actually a good piece. The thing now, are you doing this because you're recording it? Yes, but the reason why I'm recording is, is because this symphony is really good. Yeah, and there aren't any good... Rec well, there have been a couple recordings, but it's been a long time. One. There's one recording 
which is old. Right. So, um, but that's not the, the, the point. First of all, my fascination is there in the terms of this is a Pulitzer Prize winning piece. And amongst the probably 50 pieces that over the year, decades won Pulitzer Prizes, you know, and one only is played often in concert hall, which is Appalachian Spring. Everything else is either rarely played or completely forgotten. And uh, this is about a composer, Walter Piston, that in the 40s and the 50s was very popular and often played. And in, in a way, maybe just because I happened to have been, uh, two and a half months ago, I was in Finland uh, conducting there. And again, like always, I learned this thing that the Finnish people who are extremely cultured and really care about culture and education, they do something for their own artists. So Finnish music, I'm not talking about Sibelius, everybody plays Sibelius. I'm talking about people that we have never heard here. They play it all the time, hmm. everywhere, including modern music. Here in the United States, unfortunately, we have great composers over the span of probably 110 years. And aside from the, the maybe the big five or six, nada. Especially nada in terms of the people who were great and very well respected in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And Walter Piston is absolutely on the top of that. And so our new recording that we are producing as we go is um, uh, Morton Gold, another great teacher and composer. This symphony you are going to hear. And later in the season, we are recording Howard Hansen's Symphony Number no. 4. All of them Pulitzer Prize winning pieces, all of pieces that are not being played pretty much at all. Thank you. We, I, I think you will be surprised. The only thing that can be said that um, I wouldn't say it stands in his way, but Piston's music is very well crafted. That's actually a very accurate. Uh, yesterday I was behind, uh, behind the stage talking to one of my uh, violinists in the orchestra and I said, you know, for me, Piston is in a way the same as Paul Hindemith, meaning everybody knows it's great, but it's a little dry here and there and it's very well put together. So you have to, a little bit, you have to work to get to the substance. And in both cases, I discovered it gets better with the times you do it. So at the, I know, I mean, I didn't conduct a survey amongst the orchestra, but I'm sure in the first rehearsal, the orchestra's reaction was like, okay. And in the third reaction, there were cool peas. Yeah. So there you go. It's relatively short. It's compact, three movements, 20 some minutes. Yeah, barely. wonderful use of the orchestra with flute and English horn and bass clarinet and harps and it's just really good. He knew what he was doing. Who knew? It's odd that Piston spent most of his time writing symphonies and string quartets, but the piece he's best known for is the least characteristic thing he wrote, the ballet, The Incredible the Flutist, Flutist, which you've also done. Yeah, that is Piston a little more I mean, the, the music you're going to hear is very approachable, but that is Piston even on the more approachable side, and so is the second symphony. But this one is, yeah, it gets a little, at first you're like, wow, that's modern harmony language. It's muscular. It's muscular. <laughs> and then comes a very beautiful pastoral uh, movement, and then the ending is just, let's have fun. Now, since this is being recorded, the guys from Sound Mirror in Boston are here with all their magic microphones and everything. It's incumbent upon all of us to be quiet during the performance. It's being recorded for broadcast too. So there, on all classical Portland, don't you know? And probably beyond. Uh-oh, we're almost out of time, but we have so, to talk about Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Whose name you've already brought up once. Tchaikovsky, symphony number six, the symphony, in a way, the symphony of mysteries. So he wrote it towards the end of his life, uh, was very happy with it, which in terms of Tchaikovsky didn't happen so often. Um, conducted the premiere to some acclaim, 
not great, some, and nine days later he died. And uh, so there are a few mysteries. One amongst uh, the mysteries is his death, because the one led story, not legend, it's not a legend, because it might be the case, is that after this thing he was with friends and he asked for a glass of water and gulped it down despite the fact uh, that uh, his friends told me that water had not been boiled. Cholera was going around, he died of cholera. The other story says that actually he committed suicide because he couldn't live with the fact that Tchaikovsky was homosexual and homosexuality was not something that society uh, would even ac accept. And um, that all led to very mysterious things. And also the title of the symphony, Pathétique, which actually is maybe a little misleading translation of the Russian word because pathetic in a way means pathetic. This is not a pathetic <laughs> symphony. And the or original Russian world word actually means more passionate. This is a passionate symphony. And the symphony, without any doubt, ends in death. It ends... It is the most bleak and well, the whole last movement is just tragedy, ear-streaming tragedy. And the end is, ugh. Oh. And then he dies nine days later. He dies nine la you later. You gotta wonder. You, you wonder what on earth would he have written if he would have lived on? Scary. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing is that at some point, Tchaikovsky also thought about uh, naming this symphony a program symphony. And of course, over the course of uh, years, everybody said, okay, we're program, tell us. Okay, he never, he said, yes, there is a program, but he never said what it was. And now you can make up everything you want, because yes, the ending is death. The first movement, which is by quite a bit the longest, is struggle. It comes from a very dark place, and struggles and struggles and drama, and the second movement, maybe works, I don't know, like remembering something in the back and the days when we used to dance. Or Waltz something. in five, not three. Waltz. It's kind of weird. It's a weird... But it's so elegant. It's a very elegant movement. And then comes the very firm, famous march. Um, After which you'll probably burst into applause. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> they usually do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's okay, because then it makes a break between this... Well, the uh. thing is, as you know, I always say, please applaud if you feel like it. Okay. I'm not saying don't applaud, but in this, the, the, thing, the only thing that bothers me a little bit is the third movement is so brilliant and kind of calls for a reaction that the reaction can be so strong that in a way the tension in the room goes, okay, we've seen it. Oh, there was another movement. And in a way you want to, after the march, you want to go into the tension of, okay, you had your march, now let's go and die. Now, before we go and die, I want to call your attention to the fact that uh, just this week, the Oregon Symphony announced their plans for next season. So be sure to take one of these home, a whole bunch of great stuff, and Carlos on a scooter. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> and as I said, we're being recorded, you know, so make sure you turn your phones off and all that kind of stuff. And you're going to have a real ride tonight, quite a concert. Thank you for being here. Carlos Kalmar. Robert McBride.